what we saw happen uh, was um, sort of this notion uh, that Republican elected officials um, excused the behavior, um, enabled the behavior, uh, and, and by doing that, it sort of it created a situation where um, I think voters thought, well, you know, it, it must not be that he's that dangerous, because if he were, then, you know, you would have more people saying so. And, um, and I, look, I think the Republican Party leadership itself um, had to make a choice. Uh, many times they were faced with a choice between, uh, you know, doing what was right, between furthering the democracy and, and, and the Constitution, or embracing Donald Trump, and, and they chose Donald Trump. And, and it's, that, that is a situation we, haven't, we have not seen before in the history of the country. He will appoint people who will do his bidding. He will appoint people, um, and if they are nervous about doing his bidding, he'll offer them pardons. Um, and and he, won't, he won't leave office. I mean, just think about, we know he tried once not to leave office. Um, and, and he will have no incentive to guarantee a peaceful transfer of power and to leave office if he's elected again. So I, I do think it's very important for people, as frustrated as I know people get sometimes with um, you know, policy disagreements you might have, um, and I certainly have policy disagreements with the Biden administration, I know the nation can survive bad policy. We can't survive a president who is willing to torch the Constitution. I, I feel that it's very important to actually go back and look at what she did. Um, because what she did was, um, first of all, um, enabled and spread herself the big lie. And the big lie is it, this big lie that the election was rigged, that the election was stolen, that there was fraud, that, um, you know, that, that somehow Donald Trump actually won the election. That big lie is, is toxic in our democratic system. And, um, and, and her role in spreading that is important to remember. She also, though, um, we know from you know, public testimony, testimony in front of the select committee, she was directly involved, directly involved in Donald Trump's effort um, to generate fake electors, his illegal effort to um, ensure that in states that Biden won, that electors for Donald Trump would meet and would submit their electoral slates, which were fraudulent, which in some cases the electors claimed were duly certified slates of electors, um, to submit those to the Congress, to the archives, uh, so that Mike Pence would reject the real electors. And Ronna McDaniel facilitated uh, at least one phone call um, that she was on, um, along with Donald Trump and John Eastman. Now, John Eastman, just an hour or so ago, um, the, the disciplinary uh, body of the California State Bar, uh, after a very extensive set of hearings, um, recommended that John Eastman be disbarred. And, uh, and, and part of that is, is connected to his role in the fake elector plot. We also know, because this is, this is uh, on, I believe there's an audio recording of Ronna McDaniel on the phone with Donald Trump pressuring election officials in Michigan not to certify the actual legitimate results of the election in Michigan. And she said to them, if you go home tonight, don't sign on to this and we'll get you lawyers. Ronna McDaniel also called the uh, events of January 6th. She said that the January 6th Select Committee was involved in, quote, the persecution of individuals who were engaged in legitimate political discourse. So um, 
you know, those having, having um, played a role in a very uh, serious effort to overturn an election, having played a role in facilitating Donald Trump's efforts to seize power, those are the things that I think that, that people need to remember and recognize about the former chairwoman of the RNC. So every time Donald Trump says that the select committee you know, somehow suppressed evidence um, or that there's secret or hidden evidence, people should know that Donald Trump has all of that evidence. He has all of the transcripts from the select committee. If you go back to October of last year, the special counsel explained that they had produced everything, including transcripts that the select committee had to return to the White House and the Secret Service. Donald Trump has had all of that since August of 2023. In, he's had it. He also has all of the testimony that the special counsel um, has, has uh, all the testimony from the grand jury. And so Donald Trump knows what the most senior members of his administration, his vice president, his attorney general, his acting attorney general, his acting secretary of defense, he knows what all of those people said to the grand jury. And he knows how damaging that will be to him. And so, you know, when, when he now is pushing this idea that a president should have complete immunity um, against any criminal prosecution for anything he does in office, and he's pushed this appeal to the Supreme Court, I think it's very important that the Supreme Court recognize that what he's doing is a delaying tactic and that, that the American people, it, it cannot be the case that a president of the United States can attempt to overturn an election and seize power and that our justice system is incapable of holding a trial, of holding him to account before the next election. That cannot be the case. And, and the Supreme Court, um, I am, um, you know, I, I, I trust that they will um, deal in a, a responsible and, and expeditious fashion with this appeal, and, but recognize that um, uh, taking action that will result in further delay um, in preventing the American people from seeing that evidence in open court is itself uh, suppression of the evidence, that the American people have a right to see that evidence, and, and, and the court ought to recognize that. The Republicans, um, at the, you know, after the January 6th attacks, there were a couple of weeks where we were really unified, and um, everybody seemed to understand and recognize the need to, to reject what had happened, to reject Donald Trump, and to move forward. But as soon as uh, you know, Kevin McCarthy went to Mar-a-Lago, sort of welcomed Trump back into the fold, began to help rehabilitate him, I think that you, know, um, you really did begin to see uh, the development of the Republican Party um, beginning to embrace him again. And there were a whole range of reasons why that happened. I think you had, you had some elected Republicans who believed that he would just disappear who thought, you know, we don't have to actually speak against what he did. We don't have to actually stand up to him because, you know, certainly he will fade away. Um, and, and obviously that didn't happen. And, and I think when people look back at this time, at, at the history of this time, those elected officials who know the danger that he poses, who know that what he's saying is a lie, who knows, who know that he threatens fundamentally our democratic system, but yet have enabled him and have gone along, you know, they will be judged very harshly by history because the, he can't succeed without them. And, uh, and the role that they're playing is, is, uh, is a very irresponsible and reckless and dangerous one. You had Republicans in the Senate, um, conservative Republicans in the Senate, work very hard 
to come up with a, a negotiated bill, and they did. And, and it was, I mean, it, it's something that happens rarely in Congress, but they had done it. And they, they had negotiated a bill that provided additional security at the border, funding for that, and also aid to Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan. And then Donald Trump said to the Republicans in the House and the Senate, no, I, I, don't, I don't want you to do that. I, I'd rather have the issue. And so then the Republicans walked away. Now, I think that from the moment that the Republicans walked away from the negotiated deal, they can no longer say, this is Joe Biden's fault only. Because, you know, there, there was an opportunity to, to begin to make progress to fix it. 